racist and fascist and Nazis so much. Hey y'all, welcome to another Food for Thought. Today's gonna be a really interesting format. I am gonna actually um, mix things up a bit. So just gradually over the last couple of weeks, you may have noticed that I've been bringing in more from the comments sections and making that part of these videos. And I feel like moving forward to really try to keep the sense that this is a dialogue back and forth between me and you. What I'm likely going to do is I'll make a video and then I'll come back in the next video and share some of the comments that I find kind of capture a spectrum of re reactions to what it is that I've said or responses or ways of thinking, uh, perspectives around what it is that I've said. And I'm also going to be talking to you about a recent interview with Joshua Green on Democracy Now! where he was talking about links between the Trump administration and fascism and Nazism. In the last video, I was looking at this, you know, idea of racism and how sometimes the accusation of racism becomes the greatest act imaginable of someone being a racist. To accuse someone of racism in this society is about the worst thing that you can do. In fact, it seems to outweigh any behaviors or actions or ways of thinking that might actually be racist. In my video, I'm saying that it might be that people are so sensitive about the idea of being racist and can't separate themselves from the fact that we just live in a world where a lot of the structures, a lot of the ideology was formed through a racist lens. So now when we go back and look at things and try to analyze them, we often can see that things that might seem very innocent on the surface might have some layers of racism underneath. It's not necessarily that this is a good or a bad thing. It's just something that can be observed in our modern society. So first of all, I'm going to complain because Foot Soldier in his response says, I'm just going to read what he says, uh, black communities are statistically more violent and less intelligent on average than white communities according to the data I have seen. Does that mean communities are more violent or less intelligent simply by virtue of them being black? No, because correlation does not equal causation. There is a lot more to that story and when you look at case studies which control for social variables, for example, an affluent white family raises a black child, there appears to be zero significant variability of intelligence or violence between black and white subjects. Now, Foot Soldier, I'm all excited about, you know, being on your show and us having a conversation, but part of the excitement is based on the fact that we have very different political positions, very different perspectives. So if you're going to start leaving comments on my channel that make it seem like we share a lot of the same politics, what excitement is there going to be when we finally do have a conversation? G is for Gary, both G is for Gary and Kaori Flora bring up this idea that conversations about race tend to be very binary, black and white, and you know, brought up the idea that not everybody feels themselves in either one of those camps, right? There's, we, you know, exist on a spectrum. And I think that what they were bringing up really just underscores the fact that this construction of racists that we now have in, at least in the West, or at least in the United States is, you know, it's a load of crap because most people aren't on the black, aren't either black or white. They are somewhere on this spectrum. Another thing to keep in mind is that the phenotypes that we recognize as black or white show up in different spaces. So you can be European, you can be Spanish, for example, and you can appear uh, to some people to be, you know, non-white right? But that person would be categorized white. People who are from the Middle East and North Africa, at least in the United States, are categorized as white. Whereas people living in the United States may see individuals from the Middle East or from Northern Africa as non-white, which goes to show you how arbitrary these classifications can be. G is for Gary also introduced me to the term leucism. Leucism is a condition in which there is partial loss of pigmentation in an animal resulting in white, pale, or patchy coloration of the skin, hair, feathers, scales, or cuticle, but not the eyes. Unlike albinism, it is caused by reduction in multiple types of pigment, not just melanin. 
Now, Bruce Weber was kind enough to include a link to a Rational Wiki article on racialism that I'm going to include in the description box below. Africa Rising seemed a little put off by something that was in the video saying that those people you named at the end of your video are all racist. You saying they aren't is just cowardice. I don't know, do you agree? Do you feel like when I went through that list of names like Dave Rubin and Richard Spencer and saying that they weren't racist, do you feel like I was you know, being cowardly or um, were you picking up on maybe some kind of a rhetorical device that I was trying to use in that case? I don't wanna make excuses for myself, but the idea was that if no one is racist, then what is racism? Not that Richard Spencer, for example, isn't racist, or he is racist, but the question is, if we can't claim that anyone is racist without seeming racist ourselves, then, you know, what is the point of having a discussion about racism? Finally, I want to land on vlog like no one is watching, who seem to have a very um, strong reaction to comments that I made. I basically brought up something that had been talked about in a previous video of mine where I was just talking about the historical accuracy of Game of Thrones if it's trying to be set in uh, medieval Europe. The point that I was trying to make in that previous video was that there is likely more of a presence of Africans and there was more influence from Africa than we tend to get in historical depictions of that period. What I was trying to say was that the author of the novels that Game of Thrones is based on and the producers of that series are making an artistic choice when they decide to have a cast of characters mostly portrayed by white passing actors or when the author describes the characters in a way that makes them specifically of a so-called you know white phenotype now for some reason people continue to be very triggered by this observation which is just uh, you know it's a statement of historical fact which is why i was really surprised by vlog like no one's watching's response to it they say that game of thrones reference you made literally seemed like a parody of SJW thinking to me, looking from the outside. If I had stumbled upon this channel at random, I might think that comment was something from The Onion or someone trolling for a laugh. Now, someone pointing out that if Game of Thrones is trying to be an accurate historical representation of medieval Europe is, you know, flawed because there would likely have been more Africans there is a parody, then, then you know, I don't know what a parody is. Also pointing out the fact that the author had a choice in making those characters basically any race that they wanted to and they chose to make them of the, you know, white passing phenotype, not that it's problematic, but it was a choice, right? Pointing it out as a choice as opposed to something that the author was compelled to do isn't necessarily pointing out a flaw in the author themselves. The problem is in the way that that information is being absorbed. If you hearing that medieval Europe was occupied by more Africans than you see generally depicted in Hollywood films or in works of literature, then the issue is not on the historical accuracy, the issue is on you and your expectations. Also, if your response to hearing that information is, well, what's wrong with that? That also shows a limit in your thinking. It's just as easy to say, oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting, right? It's just as easy to hear that information about there being more of an African presence in medieval Europe. It's just as easy to have it pointed out that the authors are making a choice to present these characters in a certain way with a little bit of intellectual curiosity or even to ask the question, why is it being presented in that way? And to be curious enough to do some maybe research of your own. But the way I see it, as with all art forms, it's up to the audience to analyze what they've seen and to be critical of that work. If the only way that you can enjoy Game of Thrones is to simply sit back, turn your brain off, and have it wash over you, good for you. If others enjoy watching the Game of Thrones TV series and compare what they are watching to what they've read in the books, that's their prerogative. If others want to watch Game of Thrones and do some type of a political or sociological analysis, then 
that's their enjoyment. And if you disagree, you can simply say you disagree and give your reasons for disagreeing. There's certainly no need to be disparaging. Now onto the whole Nazi fascism thing. Did anyone catch the hour-long interview on Democracy Now! with Joshua Green talking about the relationship between Steve Bannon and Donald Trump? Joshua Green has just written a book on the relationship between Steve Bannon and Donald Trump. I'll include info on the book in the description box below. Joshua Green does a good job of linking Steve Bannon's social philosophy to something called traditionalism. The traditionalist school is a group of 20th and 21st century thinkers concerned with what they considered to be the demise of traditional forms of knowledge, both aesthetic and spiritual, within Western society. Traditionalists insist on the necessity for affiliation to one of the normal traditions or great ancient religions of the world. Traditionalists basically believe that the Enlightenment period of the 1500s has led us towards an apocalypse. Now, Joshua Green specifically links Steve Bannon to Julius Evola. Here are a few points to give you an idea of who this person is who served as Steve Bannon's inspiration. In 1957, Evola wrote an article attributing the perceived acceleration of American decadence to the influence of Negroes and the opposition of segregation. Evola also advocated the domination and rape of women because he saw it as the natural expression of male desire. The Jews, in Evola's view, were the carriers of a worldview, a spirit, that corresponded to the worst and most decadent features of modernity, democracy, egalitarianism, and materialism. Evola wasn't just a thinker, he actually played a role in world politics. Evola, in fact, became to Mussolini what Steve Bannon is for Donald Trump. And when Evola was done supporting the rise of fascism in Italy with his ideas, he moved on to Germany to supply some of the theory behind the rise of the Third Reich. This is not to say that these ideas espoused by Evola are intrinsically part of traditionalism. It's not even to say that Steve Bannon being an adherent to traditionalism is necessarily a bad thing. But the idea that the person who is a key advisor to the President of the United States espouses these ideas that are drawn from religious fundamentalism is a little bit problematic, especially when we see other groups being demonized because of their adherence to religious fundamentalism. I would hate to think, for example, that the increased military aggression from the United States were somehow linked to an adherence to religious fundamentalism. Might we just be witnessing the traditionalist version of jihad, for example? It just might be useful to learn a little something about traditionalism and what is inspiring the thinking in the White House right now to maybe explain some of what seems like irrational or erratic behavior coming out of the administration. I don't know, what do you think? So that's it for this video. Like it if you like it. Share, comment, subscribe. This is Reg signing off. Love yourselves. Peace. And I love myself. The world is a ghetto,